In this video, we are going to learn some concepts and formulas behind bearing capacity, modes of shear failure, methods to determine bearing capacity, and some shallow foundations and, it, and the concepts behind it. Now let's get into it. First question is, the type of foundation suitable when structural load is very heavy and the soil is in medium or loose condition is which is the type of foundation in such a situation shallow footing or underrimmed piles or combination of piles and raft or isolated footing so which type of foundation will be suitable when structural load is very very heavy and the soil condition is soil is medium or loose so for in this for this condition combination of piles and raft will be the suitable foundation now let's see about more shallow foundation types so first one is strip footing so here in this diagram you can see what is strip footing so strip footing is a continuous footing uh, in such a case load bearing wall will be there and the rows of columns closely spaced so when the rows of uh, columns closely spaced we go for strip footing or we can say continuous footing and another type is called as spread footing spread footing is done for individual column so the, for individual or you can say we can say isolated footing and that will be called as spread footing and it can be stepped to spread the load into area and another one is combined footing combined footing is when two columns are close to each other and this uh, this is called as combined footing this is a trapezoidal combined footing it can also be rectangular combined footing also and when the property line very very close to column we go for combined footing so this is the third type and fourth type is this strap footing strap footing is when center center to center distance between two columns is large so the center to center or the distance between two columns is large we have to uh, strengthen that with connecting by a strap so this is a strap beam and this strap beam is considered as, considered as a rigid beam so by uh, connecting both the columns the two footings will behave as one unit so this is called as strap footing and it will be provided when the allowable soil pressure is relatively high allowable soil pressure is relatively high and it is uh, also known as cantilever footing so this is a strap footing and another footing is called as mat foundation or mat footing or raft footing all the columns will be constructed over a single mat all the columns uh, have the base on a single mat and it will be uh, useful when there will be when there is differential settlement so it will reduce the differential settlements and also allowable pressure is low when the allowable soil pressure is low we go for mat or raft foundation uh, and to reduce and also to reduce the differential settlements and next one is the grillage foundation grillage foundation looks like this uh, heavy uh, steel beams will be there uh, it will be stacked one above the other uh, on a concrete pad heavily loaded isolated columns so when their column ha is heavily loaded and it is isolated we can go for grillage foundation and it is also a type of spread foundation so what is spread foundation the isolated foundation so isolated footing is the spread foundation grillage foundation is also a type of isolated foundation and two sets of perpendicularly placed beams so these beams i beams or we can say steel hatch beams are placed perpendicularly uh, by a stack so this is the grillage foundation so these strip pound, strip footing spread footing combined stack mat or raft and grillage foundation are some types of shallow foundation with respect to the particular usages now let's move on to second question second question is based on Trezaghi's bearing capacity analysis so in this analysis the soil wedge immediately below the footing so this is the soil wedge immediately below the footing remains in a state of what 
plastic equilibrium radial shear elastic equilibrium linear shear so that wedge that is the soil wedge immediately below the footing remains in which state whether it is in plastic equilibrium or elastic equilibrium or radial shear or linear shear so it will be in elastic equilibrium so what are the assumptions made before analysis for the Terzaghi's bearing capacity analysis first one is the footing is shallow shallow footing that means depth of footing is less than or equal to width of footing so df is less than or equal to b that means footing is shallow and the base of the footing is rough and the base of the footing is rough so this is the uh, base of the footing base of the footing and this base will be rough and the footing considered uh, the type of footing considered is strip footing that means a continuous uh, footing uh, so that it will be in two dimension condition because length is continuous length is infinity only breadth is there and the height of the footing or the depth of the footing so that's why two dimensional so continuous footing is considered and the failure mode is gsf what is gsf general shear failure we will see more about uh, general shear failure local shear failure and punching shear failure in the upcoming question and the shear resistant of, of soil above the footing so this is the soil above the footing this soil contains some shear resistance that is c5 value but that c5 or the shear resistance value is neglected stress zone up to the foundation level but not at ground level so this is the foundation level you can see here this is the foundation level and this is the ground level so stress zone is up to only foundation level not uh, it is extending up to ground level so these are some important assumptions regarding Terzaghi's bearing capacity analysis and there are three stress zones first zone is here this is first zone this is second one this is third one so first zone is elastic equilibrium so first zone is an elastic equilibrium and it is in a compacted state because of loading because of column loading it is in compacted state and by the, by the time that compacted state that is the first zone itself becomes a part of the footing and the angle made with made with the horizontal is phi what is phi angle of internal friction of the soil so phi is the angle made with the horizontal for this zone one and this is the zone 2 zone 2 is called as radial shear zone and this can be circular or log spiral this zone shape of this zone can be circular or log spiral depends on the soil conditions when the soil is clay then zone 2 will be circular in shape when the soil is a type of c5 soil or sandy soil then it will be log spiral so this shape will be based on the uh, soil type of soil present below the ground level below the uh, foundation base level and the angle made with the horizontal is phi minus 45 for zone 1 it it was phi and for zone 2 it will be phi minus 45 and the zone 3 is known as linear shear so zone 3 is here and it is called as linear shear zone or it can be also called as passive ranking zone and it also has angle of 5 minus 45 degree with horizontal so these are three zones um, three stress zones based on Terzaghi's bearing capacity analysis and these are the basic assumptions now let's move on to third question A square footing is to be proposed on a cohesionless soil with an average n value of 40. The allowable bearing pressure of this footing will be governed by GSF that is general shear failure or LSF local shear failure or progressive failure or settlement criteria. So what is the governing factor for this condition? A square footing based on 
cohesionless soil or a sandy soil with average n value or spt value of 40 so by seeing the spt value itself we can get the answer as general shear failure now let's see more about uh, gsf lsf and psf so general shear failure occurs in case of medium to dense soils local shear failure occurs in case of loose or loose sands or soft clays and punching shear failure also in loose sand or soft clays but pile foundation pile foundation and in general shear failure plastic state will be there but except at center and in local in case of local shear failure stress zone not up to ground level so that means stress zone is not extended up to ground level so it will be cut off to localized it will it will be localized only in case of punching shear failure adjacent soil is unstressed how it is unstressed for example this is a pile foundation this is a pile so punching happens over here only so adjacent soil remains unstressed nearby soils become unstressed gsf has well defined slip surface so what that means here bulging happens here bulging happens so here it will be like this here it will be like this so heaving so that's why it has well defined slip surface lsf has very very little bulging because it is localized because it is localized failure is not clear in case of gsf failure is clear in case of lsf failure is unclear in and in case of punching shear failure there will be a large settlement happens without bulging no bulging will be there no bulging like appearance will be there no bulging will be there so again gsf has uh, bulging lsf has little bulging no heaving or tilting will be there in PSF. And these are some important numerical values regarding GSF and LSF. Angle of internal friction will be greater than 36 degree and void ratio shall be less than 0.55 and density index or relative density shall be greater than 70 percentage and SPT value, N value shall be greater than 30. So in this question they have given, they have mentioned as N value 40. So if it is greater than 30, we can go for GSF and in case of lsf this the these are the criteria 5 will be greater than 28 degree p shall be greater than 0.75 degree id shall be less than 30 30 percentage n shall be less than 5 if it if this condition persists in the soil then the failure occurring in the soil can be lsf so this is how we have to uh, we have to find the governing factor to fail the soil so here in this question n value is greater than 40 so allowable bearing pressure will be gone by gsf so now let's move on to fourth question so before moving to fourth question let's see the actual diagrams regarding gsf so you can see here gsf contains bulging effect and in case of lsf there will be little bulging or no bulging and in case of punching only the stress below the uh, pile or the below the column will be there stress zone adjacent sides of the soil will not be there so this is how this is the representational diagrams of gsf lsf and psf and this is the load settlement curve so you can see there will be sudden failure happening here in case of gsf here not here sudden failures failure is not there so this is the uh, these are the basic diagrams between load and settlement curve. Now let's move on to fourth question. A building is supported on shallow foundation in sand at one meter below ground level. The water table is at five meter below ground level. For which of one of the following, which for which one of the following foundations? will be the net bearing capacity of the soil be maximum 2 meter wide strip footing 2 meter cross 2 meter square footing 2 meter diameter circular footing 4 meter cross 1 meter rectangular footing so among the following four foundation four types of uh, 
uh, foundations or footing which will be having maximum net bearing capacity for this case this will be purely based on Terzaghi's bearing capacity formulas so here in this case 2 meter wide strip footing has the highest net bearing capacity let's see how it is found so first QNU what is QNU net ultimate bearing capacity so that will be given by QU minus gamma DF so what is gamma DF surcharge surcharge is the gamma DF and QNS is net safe bearing capacity so safe means you have to divide net ultimate uh, bearing capacity by factor of safety and QS is safe bearing capacity so that means net safe bearing capacity plus gamma df plus the surcharge and what is QNA net allowable uh, pressure or net allowable bearing capacity that will be equal to minimum of QNP QNS QNS is net safe settlement pressure and NP is also the uh, net allowable pressure so these are the some basic and important formulas regarding bearing capacities and now let's see the actual uh, formula for ultimate bearing capacity behind the Zagis analysis so QU is given as that is ultimate bearing capacity is given as QU is equal to CNC plus gamma DF NQ plus 0.5 gamma B N1 so here in this question they have mentioned as sand so that means C is 0 so then this term get vanished C is 0 and gamma DF NQ plus 0.5 gamma B N gamma only be there that is one is breadth factor one is depth factor and this formula is only for strip footing or continuous footing what if uh, the footing is a rectangular then CNC into 1 plus 0.3 B by L plus gamma DF NQ plus 0.5 gamma B N gamma into 1 minus 0.2 B by L so this factors these two factors has to be multiplied correspondingly and here also this term gets vanished out in this case in this question so gamma df nq plus 0.5 gamma v and gamma into 1 minus 0.2 b by l so so this is the rectangular formula when we know the values of l and b we can just substitute and find the value of breadth factor and q u for a square is square is nothing but l is equal to b so l is equal to b means 1 minus 0.2 so that means 0 0.8 0 0.8 into 5 is 0 0.4 so 0 0.4 is got here so 1.3 how the same way l is equal to b so 1 plus 0 0.3 1.3 .3. so this is also got now this term vanished out vanishes so gamma df nq plus 0.4 gamma b and gamma is the square in this case and what if uh, it is the footing is circular then 1.3 cnc plus gamma df nq plus 0 0.3 gamma b and gamma so among these uh, four types of footing and the and the respective QU values, strip footing has the largest because gamma DF NQ is common. So cancelled out all the things. C and C that is cohesion term also get vanished because the foundation is located in a sandy strata. So only a thing left is breadth factor. So here 0.5 gamma B and gamma here also 0.5 gamma b and gamma but here this term is there so this term will reduce the breadth factor value for square it is 0.4 for circular it is 0.3 so among these four values what is the greatest one 0.5 gamma b and gamma is the greatest one so that's why 2 meter wide strip footing has the highest net bearing capacity in this scenario so this is how we have to find the answers by based on the Zagis bearing capacity analysis. Now let's see uh, some more points regarding uh, bearing capacity values. In case of pure clay, pure clay means angle of internal friction will be zero. So then the NC value will be 5.14 in case of smooth base and NC value will be 5.7 in case of rough base. So in the Zagis bearing capacity analysis, we have seen one assumption. Footing base shall be uh, assumed as rough. So in that case, NC shall be 5.7 and NQ is 1 and N gamma is 0. So these bearing capacity values are based on the 5 value only. So that so in case of in case 5 is 0, that is for pure clay, 
n c is 5.7 n q is 1 n gamma is 0 so what that means n gamma 0 breadth factor will become vanished out so n gamma here is 0 so that means breadth term will be vanished out so what that means breadth of footing has no effect in calculating q u value that is ultimate bearing capacity value so whatever the breadth of footing is that is whatever the size of footing is that won't affect the value of q u so this is one of the demerit in case of Terzaghi's bearing capacity analysis so in case of pure clay and pure clay strata breadth or size of footing does not affect the value of q u and if water table is present then how to uh, negotiate with that water table q u is equal to c n c plus gamma d f n q r w 1 plus 0.5 gamma b n gamma r w 2 so for example say uh, this is a foundation so this is the ground level so water ca water table can be anywhere uh, here or here below the footing or below the footing base or above the footing base say this height as is a w1 or is it one simply and say this height as is a two then for example for the first case uh, assume that the water table is uh, above the base of the footing so then rw1 is given by 0.5 into 1 plus z1 divided by df 1 plus z1 divided by df is the rw1 in case the water table is above the base of footing so what is the base of footing here this is the base of footing when water table is above the base of footing then rw1 shall be calculated as rw1 is equal to 0.5 into 1 plus z1 depth divided by df depth of foundation and the next scenario is water table below the foundation so then rw2 will be calculated as 0.5 into 1 plus z2 z2 divided by b what is b here breadth of foundation so this is the b value breadth of foundation and if case so there are only two cases so one is water table above the base of footing then we have to find the value of rw1 and another one is water table below the base of footing then we have to find the value of rw2 these are water table correction factors so water table correction factor ranges from 0.5 to 1 1.0 0.5 to 1.0 so based on the conditions we have to apply the corrections so these formulas are or consider are governed by GSF general shear failure what if in the it is in case of local shear failure for local shear failure mobilized uh, co cohesion value and mobilized friction value has to be adopted so that's why C mobilized or CM is equal to two-thirds of C so two-thirds of uh, actual cohesive value is the mobilized cohesion value and tan phi M is equal to two-thirds of tan phi so this is not equal to phi m is equal to two thirds of phi that will be not equal so only tangent value or the slope value has to be taken tan phi m is equal to two thirds of tan phi so these are the basic and important things regarding uh, strip footing and regarding the Zaki's bearing capacity analysis now let's move on to fifth question this question is based on plate load test a 30 cm square bearing plate settles by 8 mm in the plate load test on cohesionless soil when the intensity of loading is 180 kPa. The settlement of a shallow foundation of 1.6 m square side under the same intensity of loading is. So as per plate loading uh, test, we have to adopt a simple formula and substitute all the things over the formula to get the answer for the settlement of the actual foundation or the prototype so here answer is 22.7 mm how it is calculated let's see that 
for cohesionless soil so in this case they have given they have mentioned the soil is cohesionless so then sf that is settlement of the actual footing equal to sp sp means settlement of the pile so this is the pile uh, uh, what is the settlement over here that is sp into b into bp plus 0.3 divided by bp into b plus 0.3 squared so what is bp with the the with the, the pile load with the uh, test test pile with the test pile and what is b actual width of the footing so here 1.6 meter so b is 1.6 meter bp is 0.3 uh, meter how because 30 centimeter square bearing plate so width of the plate width of the plate is the bp so b into bp plus 0.3 here bp is 0.3 we have to substitute all the uh, with with the values in meter only here in this uh, in this component we have to uh, substitute all the width of plate uh, value and width of uh, actual footing value in meters only so that's why 1.6 0.3 is taken and here sp is the settlement of the plate so they are given as 8 mm so just simply substitute 8 into 1.6 into 0.3 plus 0.3 divided by 0.3 into 1.6 plus 0.3 squared. So that will fetch the answer as 22.7 mm. Mm. So this is how we have to calculate the settlement values. And if you want to calculate the bearing capacity value, if you know, if you know the bearing capacity of the uh, bearing plate, then QF by QP is equal to BF by BP. This will be uh, this will be the formula in case of cohesionless soil only. If it is in cohes if the soil is cohesive soil, then formula goes like this: S F by S P is equal to B F by B P. Not this. This is for cohesionless soil. So and this is for cohesive soil. So that's why that's so then the formula will be S F by S P is equal to B F by B P. That is settlement is directly related to the width of a plate and with the foundation respectively and in case of silt we have to add a power factor of 1.5 and the bearing capacity shall be more or less equal to the bearing capacity of plate itself in case of cohesive or clay soils so there are there is a difference in case of cohesion loss soil they have to calculate settlement uh, with the help of with the plate and with the foundation and in case of cohesive soil, settlement shall be directly related to the width of foundation or the width of plate only. No complex uh, calculations in this case. And in case of uh, cohesionless soil, bearing capacity shall be uh, pro shall be proportional to the width of plate or width of foundation respectively. And in case of cohesive soil, bearing capacity is more or less equal to the bearing capacity of the bearing plate. And let's see more about uh, uh, assumptions and requirements of the plate load test. Minimum thickness of plate shall be 25 mm. So minimum thickness of plate is 25 mm. And minimum size of plate is 30 cross 30 centimeter to the maximum size of 75 cross 75 centimeter. And minimum size in case of cohesive soils or clays shall be 60 cross 60 centimeter. So these are some requirements. And minimum seating pressure is 7 kilopascal. Seating load is 7 kilopascal. And test load shall be less than 20% of ultimate or the expected ultimate capacity. QU is the expected ultimate capacity. So test load shall be less than the 20% or 0.2 times QU. And factor of safety adopted is 2 to 2.5. And how loading is done? 3 times the allowable pressure allowable pressure or we can say 1.5 times the probable ultimate load and the total and the total settlement shall be greater than 10 percentage of plate size so what that means if we use 30 centimeter plate so what is the 10 percent of uh, 30 centimeter it is uh, 3 so 3 centimeters the total settlement so that's this is how we have to uh, find the values so minimum thickness minimum setting pressure and how the loading is applied so these are the some important things regarding plate load test 
Now let's move on to sixth question. Skempton's bearing capacity factor for strip footing is uh, goes here. NC is equal to 5 into 1 plus 0.2 DF by B and it shall be less than 7.5. And for rectangular footing, it will be like this. When DF by B is less than 2.5 and DF by B is greater than 2.5. So which options are correct? Strip footing, rectangular footing. So so all the three options that is a b and c three options are correct in case for the bearing skempton's bearing capacity factor nc value so, so for strip footing nc value is 5.0 into 1 plus 0 0.2 df by b and it shall be less than it shall not be greater than 7.5 and in case of rectangular footing, NC value is given as 5 into 1 plus 0.2 into DF by B. And this factor has to be multiplied 1 plus 0.2 into P by L. This will be in case of DF by B ratio less than 2.5. And in case of greater than 2.5, uh, just uh, add 7.5 into 1 plus 0.2 into DF by B. So these are the some important things regarding NC values behind uh, Skempton's bearing capacity theory and let's see other theories and other important points also Skempton's theory is based on site investigation and it is suitable for cohesive soils only so for cohesive soil only NC value will be predominant so that's why NC value for each and every type of footing is given by Skempton so Skempton's theory is suitable for cohesive soils and mayor of theory says a uh, mayor of theory is suitable for both shallow and deep foundation and this theory and the is code method is based on the mayor of theories only the soil above footing will have searing resistance in case of terzaghi's bearing capacity theory soil above the footing is neglected searing capacity searing resistance of soil above the footing base is neglected in case of terzaghi's bearing capacity theory but in case of mayor of theory Soil above footing will have shearing resistance and here no water table correction. There will be no water table correction and uh, QU is given by C, N, C, D, C, S, C, I, C plus gamma D, F, N, Q, D, Q, S, Q, I, Q plus 0.5 gamma B, N, gamma, D, gamma, S, gamma, I, gamma. So what are the factors? S is safe factor and D is depth factor and i is inclination factor so these many factors or these three factors are multiplied in each uh, term on its breadth term on its depth term on its cohesion term so cnc dc saic plus gamma df nq dq sq iq plus 0.5 gamma b n gamma d gamma s gamma i gamma but no water table correction is present in case of is code method the same formula is adopted but with water table correction rw so these are some uh, important theories regarding uh, the ultimate bearing capacity regarding the determination of ultimate bearing capacity and Skempton's theory is suitable only for cohesive soils. So now let's move on to seventh question. The standard penetration resistance value obtained in a deep deposit of sand at a depth of 6 meter was 28. So first n value is 28. The unit weight of sand is given as 18 kilonewton per meter cube. Now we have to find the corrected value of number of blows for overburden and dye latency if water table is above the test level. So what is the number of blows actually? Actually they have uh, asked the value of n after correction. That is corrected n value for overburden and also the dye latency. So there are two corrections. We have to adopt a simple formula. Two formulas are there regarding overburden, also the dye latency. So we have to use those formulas to find the values. So here 55 for overburden, after overburden and after dye latency correction, n value becomes 35. Now let's see how it is calculated. 
So overburden correction is given by n is equal to n dash into 350 by sigma bar plus 70. But sigma bar shall not be greater than 280 kN per meter square. So here n dash is 28. So n dash is known 28. 350 by gamma sigma bar plus 70. What is sigma bar? 18 into 6. So 18 into 6 is the uh, sigma bar effective overburden pressure. And the water table is above the test level. So that's why 18 into 6 simply. So n is equal to n dash into 350 divided by sigma bar plus 70. So simply substitute the value and get the answer for n as 55. And after getting that n value, just substitute here to find the correction after dilatancy. So nd is equal to 15 plus half into n minus 15. That is 55 minus 15. So that will fetch the answer for uh, n value after dilatancy correction as 35. So these are the two important formulas regarding the SPT or n value correction. Now let's see uh, other important things regarding SPT, standard penetration test. So average n value, if we have uh, more than one n values, then we have to uh, normalize or we have to average it. So how to average? Just simply add all the values divided by the number of values. But the SPT values should lie between 0.5 n to 1.5 n that is 50 percentage of the average to uh, 150 percentage of the average other values are disregarded or discarded and again average n value is calculated for example say one n value is obtained as 10 one value is 20 one is 30 and another one is 40 and we are averaging all the things when average is calculated, then that will become 100. Right, that will become 100. But 0.5 n to 0.5 n to 1.5 n. So that means 50 to 150. Correct, 50 to 150. Oh, sorry. Uh, actually, it's just divided by 4. Then it will be 25. 25 only so the range is 0.5 into 1.5 n so that means 0.5 into 25 becomes 12.5 and 1.5 times 25 is 1.5 times 25 is 37.5 then what are the values to be discarded 10 is not in the range 20 is in range 30 is in range and 40 is outside the range so only 30 and uh, 20 are uh, 20 and 30 are the correct values so that means 20 plus 30 again uh, get the average 20 plus 30 divided by 2 so that means 50 by 2 25 25 is the correct answer for in this case so a simple calculation so just average all the things and get the uh, range and within the range what are the n value what are the values actually lie so that those n values are the correct uh, SPT values and average of those value has to be calculated as final and next point is number of blows required for 300 mm penetration so what actually is the SPT value SPT value is nothing but number of blows required for 300 mm or 30 centimeter penetration is the SPT value during SPT uh, experiment during SPT found finding first 150 mm or 15 centimeter is neglected because of uh, because of the sand is loose sand is in loose condition so after that thing after those uh, 150 mm penetration we will be calculating the SPT value and SPT value is used to determine ID that is density index UCS unconfined compression QU, ultimate bearing capacity, allowable bearing capacity and the angle of internal friction and the pile load and these many parameters are determined by uh, using SPT value. So these are the some basic and important points regarding standard penetration test. Now let's move on to 8th question.
Stacher's method to determine elastic settlement is given by S is equal to KQ root A into 1 minus nu square by E or this formula or this. So which is the correct formula to determine elastic settlement as per Sclater's method. Elastic settlement by Sclater's method. So it is given by option A. S is equal to KQ root A into 1 minus nu square by E. So what is OA? A is nothing but area we know. Nu is Poisson's ratio. E is Young's modulus. Q is uh, actually Q is nothing but capital Q divided by B. That is load per unit width. So K is the uh, factor. And S is equal to K into Q root A 1 minus nu square by E. So point to be noted is settlement where is uh, square root times a so that means for example s1 by s2 will be equal to root of a1 by root of a2 so this is the important point regarding this formula and now let's see what are the other theories regarding this based on classical earth pressure theory there are two there are three theories rankine's theory focus theory bell's theory and based on plastic theory there are many things Fellinius theory, Prandtl's, Terzaghi's, Mayerhoff's. So we have seen Terzaghi's theory, Mayerhoff's theory, Skempton's theory also, Balla, Vizik, uh, Bring Hansen. So Vizik's theory uh, has the base in case of IS code method. So IS code is based on Vizik's theory. So Fellinius, Prandtl, Terzaghi's, Mayerhoff, Skempton, Balla's, Vizik's theory and Bring Hansen theory are those things are based on plastic analysis. And by using codal provisions like BIS, IRC, CPW, we can calculate the QU values. By using field methods like SPT, standard penetration test, cone penetration test, and plate load test. By using all these uh, tests, we can find the value of ultimate bearing capacity and also the uh, settlement. So these are the basic theories to determine the settlement and the QU value. Now let's move to ninth question. So given figure represents, so this is a pressure distribution diagram of a uh, footing in a uh, soil base. So what would be the correct one? Flexible footing over clay soil or rigid footing over clay soil or flexible footing over granular soil or rigid footing over granular soil. So what this kind of contact pressure distribution represent? So this represents rigid footing over clay soil. So as you can see here in this case of flexible footing, in case of clay, then distribution shall be like this, only a circular curve. And in case of sand, distribution shall be like this, a inverted circular curve. In case of rigid footing, then the pressure shall be like this in case of clay. So this is the diagram they have given. So that's why rigid footing over clay soil. That is at the edge of the footing there will be more pressure. At the edge of the footing there will be more pressure. And in case of sand, pressure shall be like this. That's just simple circular curve or a simple semicircle. And in case of silt, Pressure distribution is irregular, so that's why it goes like this. So this is the actual, this is the settlement. This is how settlement occurs. There will be no flexibility because in the name itself we can get uh, this is a rigid foundation. And in case of uh, settlement and flexible footing, it will be a curvy, it will be a curve uh, path. And these are the important diagrams regarding flexible footing and rigid footing over clay soil and sandy soil. Now let's move to last question. The bearing capacity factors NC, NQ and N gamma are functions of width and depth of footing, density of soil, cohesion of soil, angle of internal friction of soil. So what is the factor 
um, based uh, on which bearing capacity factors NC, NQ, and N gamma are found. This we have already seen in one of the previous questions. So angle of internal friction of soil is the basic uh, factor that will be used to find NC, NQ, and N gamma. How it is done? By using these many formulas. NQ is equal to e power phi tan phi into n phi so n phi is set factor and n phi is given as n tan square 45 plus phi by 2 and nc is nothing but nq minus 1 into cot phi and n gamma is 1.8 into nq minus 1 into tan phi so all these n values depends on phi value only so that's why nq nc n gamma are the functions of angle of internal friction that is phi value so nq is the c uh, nq is e power phi tan phi into n phi or tan square 45 plus phi by 2 and nc is nq minus 1 into cot phi and n gamma is 1.8 into nq minus 1 tan phi so these are the important formulas regarding the bearing capacity factors so we have learned many concepts and many formulas behind the bearing capacity and also the salar foundation and also we have seen some types of salar foundation like strip footing strap footing and what else mat footing grillage foundation like that so if you like this video please like and comment and also share with your friends thank you for watching